morning, everybody. Um, to those on screen now and to our participants who are joining us in the Zoomosphere, uh, thank you so much. What a great opportunity to talk to everybody about uh, productivity in New South Wales. And while it might sound like a dry subject, it's not if that if addressing productivity helps uh, get you a job, get your pay rise, get your project developed, get your regulation removed, and generally in a post-COVID world, I think of no better time. Uh, we're talking particularly to Peter Arkestrat uh, this morning, uh, the Productivity Commissioner of New South Wales, formerly the Auditor General of New South Wales, who so knows where the bodies are buried, he knows how to, how to dig them up, get them out again, uh, and also the Chairman of uh, Bankstown Airport, for his, who has, so he has a bit of skin in the game with regulation and, and, and productivity himself. After we've had a chat to Peter and, and got a bit of background to the report and the green paper he's just released for the government, um, we're going to have a, a superstar panel of Marianne Graham, um, the head of all things external and uh, policy and public affairs at Sydney Water, with a distinguished background in infrastructure advisory work over many years. To Matt Gosselman, the CEO of the New Alliance, uh, that unholy gathering of three universities plus Western Sydney University who have ambitions to develop a new campus at the Eritropolis, the aforementioned multiversity. And Ramin Malik, uh, who's a member of the Generation West, the Dialogue Zone Youth Advisory Panel. She's a chemical engineering student at Sydney. She's a, she's a, she's a poet and she's a rock star. So we're uh, delighted that she can join, join in. Uh, in welcoming everybody in, uh, and uh, me and my colleague Adam Leto, the Executive Director of the Dialogue, I first wanted to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all sit in different places. So uh, I'm currently on Gadigal land of the Aurora Nation, or practically Wongal land of the Aurora Nation, as my daughter tells me every day with her, when she does grace, to thank the Wongal people. Um, but to my mob arrived here 200 and something years ago as involuntary tourists at the bottom of the ships, to the mob who've looked after the joint for 60,000 years. Thank you so much. We honour your uh, descendants, your uh, past, present, particularly the emerging leaders of Western Sydney, remembering that Western Sydney is the largest urban Aboriginal population in Australia, and we, we take that very seriously. Um, let's, as I, I'm gonna a big, I'm gonna uh, pardon our, our panelists, for just a short time we talk to Peter, we'll, we'll bid them farewell. Uh, and then they'll come back after Peter has something to say. And then after that, Adam Leto is going to come back and moderate your questions. So if everybody's listening in, oh, we've got to 63 instantly. So um, down the bottom, if you haven't done it before, the chat chat button, start putting your questions up. Peter's going to be so provocative, you're going to have hours and hours worth of questions, but we'll squeeze as many in as we can. So uh, with that, why don't we kick off? Peter, good morning formally, sir. Welcome. Thank you for your service. Um, Again, now in the service of New South Wales. Maybe you might want to just give us a quick run through to the, the Productivity Commission and the review. And I should point out, you're also running another review for the government at the moment, particularly on, uh, on infrastructure financing, which we've also had some discussions about. Um, but maybe you want to take us through the background of the review and I think get a couple of slides to give us some detail, then we'll have a bit of a chat about that. Great. Look, thanks very much, Christopher. Thanks for the opportunity to say a few words and also to get a few questions and maybe get a bit of feedback on this. Uh, particularly thank you also, Christopher, for your um, ongoing passion for productivity, the way you've been helping with the Western Sydney Dialogue, uh, getting the airport up and running and other things. Really do appreciate everything you've done. Uh, and it's lovely to be talking here um, to an audience which has a, a, large, a large number from the Western Sydney area. Uh, I was a lecturer at uh, Western Sydney University uh, for some time in taxation, a wonderful subject, I love that. And I always enjoyed giving the occasional speeches at Western Sydney University graduations for accountants. I tried to make them all become auditors, but many of them were going to finance. Look, just on our report, uh, Christopher, um, traditionally over the last 20 to 30 years, um, productivity in Australia has increased every year. So traditionally, there's more goods and services were produced each year than the year before. So the standard of living could rise and there was upward pressure on real wages. Real wages could go up because there's more goods and services per person. Over the last four or five years though, the productivity gains have, have tapered off and slowed. In fact, last year it was negative. So there were less goods and services produced last year than the year before. 
And that puts pressure on standard of living and it also puts downward pressure on real wages. So the state government thought, well, look, a lot of, a lot of um, productivity reform has been done at the federal level. They've floated the dollar, they've reduced tariffs, they've uh, expanded the um, uh, competition with overseas banks, etc. Now it's time for the states to step up to the plate. So two years ago, the state treasurer established the New South Wales Productivity Commission. Initially, uh, Christopher, what our role was, we were giving ad hoc recommendations to the government and to cabinet, and I'm very pleased that every one of our recommendations was, was accepted and implemented, uh, and recommendations from payroll tax to funerals, etc. Uh, but they're all ad hoc one-off, and then the treasurer said to me, would I be able to produce a white paper with a large number of um, reform so that rather than getting uh, ad hoc, we can have a holistic approach. And I said, look, the way I like to develop policy is not just to come up with a white paper to say, here are the solutions, because traditionally, if you say, here are the 40 solutions, um, it doesn't get off the ground. It can be knocked back in the first week after they're announced. So I've used a three-stage approach. The first one was a discussion paper saying, these are the areas where I think we could focus on for productivity reform. Can I get views from the public on that? And we've been inundated with, with um, views from the public. We've used all those views to draft up the Green Paper. Uh, and the Green Paper uh, has 56 recommendations in it uh, in relation to six areas. We've only focused on six areas, um, skills, schools, regulation, state taxation, infrastructure and planning, and water and energy. We've only focused on those because there's a myriad of other things which other people are working on, such as mental health, which is a wonderful, a, a real lever for productivity, and there's other, um, uh, other areas which other people are looking at. We wanted to focus on things which the state government could influence and do fairly quickly. So we focused more on schools and TAFE rather than universities, because the universities is more of a national thing, uh, etc. So we've, and we've had good response to it. So I'll just run through a couple of uh, slides, uh, Christopher, and basically what we've done is we've set out the problem in the green paper, made a couple of comments, and then listed other people's recommend uh, ideas. And my goal now is to distill those ideas, get feedback on those specific ideas, produce a white paper early next year with my concluded recommendations. So these recommendations I'm putting up are more from the public rather than myself. I have vetted them a bit to make sure that I'm not putting something up which is totally unimplementable. But my goal is to get everything uh, possible uh, implemented. I don't really right. particularly want to make a recommendation uh, which is not implementable. Now, I'm not sure if you can see the screen there, um, Christopher, can you see it? Yep, okay, so I'll run very quickly through this. So as I showed you before, the productivity has fallen and you can see in 18, 19 it fell. And this year it's gonna fall even more because of COVID. So the process we used, we did a discussion paper. Um, we've got a lot of ideas. Um, had nine official round tables with dozens of unofficial round tables. And then we've produced the green paper with reforms. And we've had a lot of good response. Um, over 2 million people have seen the, uh, the, the white paper. Not all of them have read every page, but uh, we're very pleased that there's been good feedback on it. Uh, so essentially we've looked at seven areas. We've looked at schools, we've looked at skills, which is mainly in the vet area. We've looked at regulation, uh, we've looked at water and energy, we've looked at infrastructure, how to make the best use of that. We've looked at planning and most of our feedback has been in relation to planning and schools. Uh, and we've looked at state taxation. So essentially what we've done, I'll just wrapping up now, on relation to each of the seven areas, Christopher, what we've done is we've set the problem out. So for example, you can see with the, uh, with the schools, you can see here that the spending per student has increased uh, over the last 15 years. The spending has gone up, but the results have fallen. So, uh, and that's the average of PISA results have fallen. Uh, some schools, the results have gone up. But if in some areas they've gone up and the average has gone down, you can see that some schools has fallen dramatically. So we set out the problem with each of the seven areas. Then we put out what we think some of the recommendations to address these are. And in relation to, to the schools, we're saying the primary area where we think we can focus on improving is um, the efficacy of teachers in the classroom uh, and the supply of teachers. We've got recommendations in there on how to get um, uh, finance executives mid-career to join the teaching profession, uh, etc. 
on skills, what we've done is we've done an analysis to show where the skill shortages have been in New South Wales uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, and there's a air conditioning mechanics, as most people know, severe shortage, uh, et cetera, uh, and sheet metal workers, chefs, et cetera. So they're where the shortages are. And what we found is that um, a lot of people are doing courses for jobs, and what we want to do is make it so that where there's a shortage, that's where the jobs are done. So we've got some recommendations in there on how to improve that. Uh, in relation to regulation, what we've done is we've looked at the existing, there's been an appetite for regulatory reform during COVID, during the pandemic, the government's been able to implement a lot of regulatory reform, which the community I don't think would have accepted without COVID. Um, the community now accepts um, deliveries to Coles and Woolies at three o'clock in the morning, which makes a lot of noise. They never used to accept that. The community accepts electronic signatures. What we want to do is look at the um, these regul these regulations which have been Im implemented, and their supermarkets, their um, relation to uh, pharmacists being able to dispense low um, low risk uh, medicines, etc. And you can see our recommendation down here is that we're saying every one of these regulations which have been lifted during COVID should continue to be lifted until they've been evaluated. So instead of automatically going back to how we were, you, you, you have to present a case for that. Uh, and so then we've looked at other areas of uh, regulation and reform, such as uh, how do we get, and, and there's two sides to every coin now. If we look at the one on the left here, um, we know there's a shortage of certain skills. We're saying, why don't we recognise the skills from Queensland and Victoria and let them come and work in New South Wales? There's concern, of, of course, of the tradespeople in New South Wales thinking, why do we want to have these people taking our jobs? Uh, so that's an interesting one. I'm from Holland, as many of you know, and uh, in Holland, we allow an Italian builder to come in. We recognise their qualifications. Um, but in New South Wales, we don't necessarily recognise the qualifications from other states. So we're saying maybe we should do that. We're talking about the single desk rice marketing, etc., and a number of others uh, areas. So that's in relation to regulation. It is interesting, just to digress, some of the recommendations I've put in, I thought were really good, but the feedback has been negative. For example, drones. I've got a, re a recommendation in there. At the moment, a farmer can only use drones to inspect their property if there's line of sight. So they can basically only do it within a, a couple of kilometers. We're recommending if you've got a farm over 10,000 hectares, you should be able to use it without line of sight. That, that way it reduces the quad bike accidents. It allows people to get to other sides of the property to inspect stock, people for, uh, stock falling into the river, etc. But the feedback we're getting from the farmers um, is that they don't want that. They're concerned uh, of safety issues. So it's good to take all those things on board. Housing, you can see there on the bottom left, New South Wales housing um, takes a lot longer to be approved than in other states. Why is that? Well, we've got some uh, solutions there. Many relate to doing things um, in tandem rather than sequentially. Maybe we could get um, different departments, RMS and planning, etc., and local council be working at the same time rather than waiting for one to do something and then the next. We can see our housing supply, while the shortage in the next few years is not going to be as great as people probably thought, maybe because of um, the change to the migration, etc. but then it'll grow again, the shortage. So we've got to do something. We also look, just as the penultimate slide, at uh, water and energy policy. How can we improve the reliability of the customer's needs? Um, new ways to fund regional water utilities. There's 92 water utilities. Um, we want to make sure they can work better. Infrastructure, we're saying that um, Let's do all our development where there's already infrastructure. If there's already a train station, let's build near that rather than necessarily build all extra things. We're also talking about um, spreading the work, like the, the, the usage of roads much more um, uh, evenly, uh, maybe talking about cordon charging, congestion charging, uh, things like that. With energy, we are talking about neutral energy. So we're saying maybe small nuclear reactors, small modular reactors using nuclear or hydrogen could be something to consider. Those rules were put in 87, maybe the rules changed. Taxation, we're talking about a national payroll tax system. Um, in New South Wales, we've got 50,000 payroll taxpayers, over 20,000 pay payroll tax in other states. They've got different sorts of rules, etc. Why don't we have one set of administration Maybe each state can have their own threshold and our own rates, but let's have one national and uh, uh, rules. Uh, we're also talking about li uh, lifting rate capping for local government uh, areas. 
if the voters or the constituents in that local government area vote that they should be lifted. So I guess uh, that's a bit of a whirlwind snapshot, Christopher, and uh, welcome um, to some questions or a bit of a discussion with you first, maybe. Thanks, Peter. That'd be great. We'd like to have a little chat and then we'll bring our panellists in and encourage people to continue to populate the chat, chat room with questions. And Adam's got plenty of them already. Um, we're speaking to a group of now 74 people out there, an eclectic range from the CEO of, Integral, of, of Endeavour Energy and a range of bureaucrats and leaders up to the, the legendary Brian Brown, one of the great sons of Western Sydney. I didn't know uh, you haven't touched on acting actors' rates, have you, Peter, in the uh, submission? But no, but no, but I did see Mr. Brown perform at the Bankstown um, out there conference that you the dialogue ran, and it was brilliant, Mr. Brown. Indeed, thank you very much. His for first that. piece of spoken word poetry. Thank you, Dr. Brian Brown. I am. Um, so I suppose when you look at productivity now, traditionally, as I grew up, productivity meant how you can make squeeze a little more out of the labour force to get profit in a, in a simplest form. The, the low growth of wages in Australia for many years would suggest it's not so much an issue of that anymore. We need, there's other parts to, 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 out, to induce productivity and it's investment and it's regulation. It's not labour costs as much as it, as it might have been, you know, industrial practices many years past. Um, therefore, you, you're looking largely only at the government side of what it can do to, to enhance productivity or have you been happy to give recommendations to industry as well? Well, a, a bit of both, mainly because we're in government, we can control those things, but we think some of the regulatory reform will spur on the business. For example, while we talk about government assets being used more evenly throughout the day, also business assets. If you've got a cafe, I mean, what does it have to shut? What do the rules have to change for the licensing come by the clock uh, and all those things? And so it relates to both, but you're absolutely right. It was labour productivity. Uh, and people say, why is it that, um, in Australia, in New South Wales, it takes five days on average for a worker to produce something, whereas the same worker can produce it in America in four days. Um, so why is that? Well, it's technology, yes, it's capital, yes, but it's also regulation, it's also rules, etc. So we're not talking about the labour person doing the product doing anything differently. We're talking about unshackling other things so that um, they can get done in four days what's now taking them five days to do. The labour equivalent might be, as you touched on, increasing the skills of labour as opposed to making them work harder longer um, in that, that simple labour supply equation. Um, I think one of the scariest slides you showed there was that it's almost the same in, in outcomes for Indigenous Australians. It's not been a lack of money going into schools to improve output, but the metrics we're using, and people might quibble over what, what is the right testing metric, but on any standard metric, funding's gone up, performance has gone down. That has to be of great concern to, to governments, to parents, to students themselves. There's plenty of students online too. Um, is it about teacher quality and therefore teacher remuneration? Is it simple as that? Where, where, where do you to dig a little well, deeper into the education area? Look, it's about teacher effectiveness rather than necessary teacher quality. I mean, we've got wonderful teachers. Um, what we've got to do is make sure they're not bogged down with a hundred other things, administrative things, et cetera, and things like that. I'm not, of my 56 recommendations, Christopher, I'm not talking about adding more money to the, to the budget and saying, you've got to spend more money on this. Most of my recommendations are, let's take um, things away so that you know, things can be done easier. Uh, and so, for example, on the schooling side, what we're saying is, what is the main determinant of, of performance? We're finding that it's not necessarily uh, um, add-ons. Yeah, teach, um, class sizes is a factor, this is a factor, but it's mainly the efficacy of the teacher in the classroom. So we're suggesting things such as better feedback uh, to the teachers. At the moment, because of COVID, the teachers have got a lot of... I once gave feed feedback to my teacher and got kicked out. Um, <laughs> once. Well, well, obviously that was good feedback. They made the right decision. It was good right, punishment so. that followed too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they've had feedback. Teachers have uh, adapted remarkably to the pandemic and with the online work they've done, they've had 30 people giving, 30 parents giving feedback every day. Yeah. Uh, and what we want to do is maybe make that a bit more structured because sometimes it's just the squeaky wheel that gives that feedback. We want to make that uh, more effective. So we're, none, not many of my recommendations are saying, let's spend more money and we'll get a better result. Uh, we're saying let's right. do things differently. With the teachers, as I said, there's some finance executives out there that would want to become maths teachers. There's a shortage of maths teachers in New South Wales and science teachers. 
But who at 45 years of age is going to give up a finance executive job to do four years study to be a teacher and then find um, uh, they've got to pay the mortgage for those four years? We're also suggesting, just on the, on the wages, we are suggesting that in New South Wales, the entry level wage for a teacher is, is sound, it is, is comparable to OECD, but it sort of is fairly flat. It doesn't go doesn't give opportunity. So we're suggesting, and if they want a pay rise above a certain level, Christopher, they have to leave the classroom and actually become an administrator somewhere. So we're suggesting a new role called instructional lead. Uh, not a lot of them, but yep. these people can stay in the classroom, they can mentor others, etc. Peter, will that also help in the TAFE area where uh, back in the day when you finished your career at Multiplex or Lend Lease, you might have gone back to TAFE and, and put back in. It's very hard to do that now particularly because of the wage differential in building trades, is there a capacity to bring experts into TAFE to, to help, you know, to address the, the apprenticeship issues and the reskilling issues? Well, look, I'll, I'll just write that one down because we hadn't covered that, but I think it's an excellent idea to, um, to do the same thing. Both we, what we did cover with the TAFE is more, I'll just make, write, make a note of that. So it's bringing the teachers, bringing the people back in, but um, in relation to the TAFE, what we've covered mainly on those ones, Christopher, is um, the dropout rate in, in, in uh, apprenticeships is very high at the moment. So people start and after six months they drop out. And what we're trying to do is find out if a 21 year old wants to be um, enter a trade, it's hard for them to do that because um, the employer can't really pay adult wages to someone who's a first year apprentice. So we're looking at ways um, to make the apprenticeship for the more mature people a bit shorter, maybe a two year one instead of a four year, et cetera, and things like that. Perfect. Um, in TAFE, I know there's a separate review being undertaken at the moment by Professors Gonski and Shergold uh, into TAFE along with Stephen Forby. So I suppose your your trade skills uh, recommendation can sit along, alongside that. But Absolutely. From a Western, Western Sydney perspective, there's no region in Australia more dependent upon a good operating, growing, smart TAFE than ours, both to meet the skill shortage we have and the social the social issues of TAFE where kids getting out of the hood are most likely to happen through a TAFE, to, through a, a TAFE pathway. So it's vital importance to us. Look, absolutely, Christian. And as you've always pointed out, advanced manufacturing is an area which Western Sydney can pick up on. So that it doesn't really um, the, con the concerns of labour costs aren't as much there, but it's more the other sides of things, the regulation, the infrastructure, the technology. So advanced, I think we've got a golden opportunity now to grab some of this uh, advanced manufacturing where the labour component, uh, Australia is not priced out of it because we're really adding value. And you can mark another one down. We're certainly going to be coming forward soon with the, taking up the, tr the uh, transport minister's challenge about manufacturing transport and electric vehicles, then why wouldn't Western Sydney be thinking about a unique partnership between labour and government and industry to prove up our capacity to build electric buses, electric vehicles going forward and get that advanced manufacturing legacy going again. So the things we're looking at. Peter, I'm particularly interested, the other big issue for us out of your report is water. Western right. Sydney, not only the Western, um, Western Parkland City, which you address specifically, and has all its challenges around South Creek and the movement of water, and we've been heavily engaged with that, and, and a cheer squad for what City Water's trying to do, but also the Central River City and its dependence upon recreational water and the Great Rivers. You can't call it the Central River City when the rivers are, are pretty dusty. Um, so you've seen some great opportunity for recycled water, um, because the flip side of productivity is the cost if we're gonna to continue to treat water the way we have from another 20 kilometres west to the ocean and back is, is mind boggling in that productivity sense. Where do you see your report having most impact in the treatment of water and the growth of the Western city? Look, I'm, I'm very glad you've mentioned the, the parklands. We've made a couple of references in there to best practice, which the Western City Parklands area is doing. Also, I'm glad you made the point, which not everyone makes, the point of the cost of taking wastewater from the west to, to the east and then bring other water backwards, et cetera, if there's a diesel needed. People tend to think uh, we're using recycled water because we want to um, save the amount of water which is in the dams. Yeah, that's true. We also want to save the cost or this capital cost of transporting it. So and the energy um, so, required to do oh, absolutely, it. Oh, absolutely. So two parts to the answer there, uh, Christopher. First is the demand side of all water. Now in New South Wales, the average person uses 217 litres of water a year. But in Victoria, they only use 171. Now, why do they use 25% less water 
in, in, in Victoria. We can speculate on those sorts of things, but so there's a demand management side of things there. Is the price of our water too cheap? too sure about that or do, are people wasting our precious water is there more leakage in our system so on the demand so on the uh, demand side we're looking at it but in relation to the wastewater what we're asking is for, for uh, the water utility companies in IPART to look at a holistic approach to the marginal cost of um, not just the marginal cost the total cost of dealing with wastewater the, it's, we, we put a major review in last year on uh, with all the hot issue and all the environmental issues of the region and very much involved in that is some market-based systems to increase um, recycling. We, uh, we want to help the tree, uh, Premier meet her tree planting um, targets, but it's pretty difficult if we don't have the water to do it. I might just add one thing, I think you might mark down, Peter, the productivity costs of driving you know, thousands and thousands of petrol tankers every day from Banks Meadow to Sydney Airport to service stations across uh, Western Sydney, let alone when the Western Sydney Airport is going to require its own Avgrass line, the concept of the fuel pipeline, I think will become a major productivity and safety and environmental and cost issue, which uh, we'll, we'll, we'll address as well. Just maybe one other I want to touch on before we, we throw open is probably going to, to housing for you. Uh, again, one of the other existential problems for Western Sydney is the cost of housing and the availability of housing. And in a flip side, if all the recent predictions are right, then the collapse in housing demand in the private sector affects our economy because we're home to so many tradies and so much of our economy is based on residential development. Um, in that uh, concept of the supply of housing, uh, you point to some planning issues that seem ridiculous and almost embarrassing for us in New South Wales, the, the regulatory requirement. Um, whether it's a mixed state government, council, whatever regulation, you're confident you can really get a get a get a shot away at this one to to, to stoke the fire of housing and hopefully affordable housing development. Yes, and you made a good point. Affordable housing, and we've also got um, the affordability of housing um, as opposed to affordable housing. So we've got both, and we've got the supply side of things. Look, some of our I'm very confident we've done a review of the Independent Planning Commission and all 12 of my recommendations were accepted by government and I think um, all sides of people were, all, all sides of the, the ledger were uh, uh, pleased with the outcome so in relation to these ones we're not going to solve it completely but I think we will as you've said uh, Christopher we will make some inroads why is it that we've got 13 different um, zones uh, in New South Wales I think in Victoria there's only five zones if you want to change the use of something you've got to do XYZ. Developer contributions, as you said, a separate review that I've got to look at. Uh, and that also covers, we talked about water. Why is it that there's no developer contribution for certain water infrastructure projects that have to be done? But more importantly, in relation to housing, um, with the approval process, if we can get more of the things, uh, the approvals done in tandem, done at the same time, rather than sequentially. Now, you can't tell me that um, it's going to take 16 months to approve something, it must be sitting on someone's desk for uh, 14 of those months. Uh, now, clearly, they've got to go out for community consultation on many things, except that. But I think if we can um, truncate many of those things, it'll be, be much quicker on the housing affordability. And the, the cost of the regulation on housing is, uh, is, is quite significant. Look, as we bring um, the, our panellists back in, I'm going to leave uh, one question for you. You've worked in and around government for a large part of your career with real exposure to the issues involved. When you're addressing regulatory productivity, which you a large place have done, is it is it cultural constraint? Is it a public service that needs to know it the government had political arm the government has its back, will back it in to be a little braver, a little bolder? Do you find usually it's a political blockage or a bureaucratic blockage to make government as more productive as it can be to help all of us be productive? 12 months ago, Christopher, I would have said all three of those. Today, I will say there is a real appetite for regulatory reform, a real appetite. Things uh, that some of the change, you take housing, construct, housing, for example, 12 months ago, the community and government probably wouldn't have accepted the idea of people building on Saturday morning at eight o'clock in the morning because of the noise it was going to make. But the community, I think, have rallied around and they've said, we will now accept the, that builders can build at eight o'clock on, on Saturday morning. The community has accepted that. Where my concern is, Christopher, is this appetite for reform may dry up uh, as the pandemic um, eases a little bit. And what I don't want to happen is everything go back to how it was before. 
uh, we want to harness these new ones. And any new recommendations I've got, I feel, Christopher, I've got six months to get them up and running. I think there'll be an appetite for six months yep. where people are right. saying, well, let's get it done. We've got to get out of this. After six months, or and I, whatever the time is, where people's balance sheets are stretched, household balance sheets stretched, companies that have been uh, subsidising things, their balance sheet stretched, and government's balance sheets are stretched. When a balance sheet uh, is not healthy, people tend to go back to the status quo. They tend to not be as, have a, as good a risk appetite. So I'm busting to get my, the feedback on the green paper as quickly as possible and to get the recommendations out while there is an appetite, appetite for them. To answer your question, I would have said, yes, you're exactly right 12 months ago. We've got a real window of opportunity now. Let's get some of that feedback for you. And who better to go to than three great agitators that I know? Um, let's go off with Matt Gosselman and get a, you know, a couple of Dutchmen going in one go here. Um, Matt. Uh, It'll be very polite, at least. <laughs> right. You're a polite people, I think it's fair to say. Um, let me just ask you from a new alliance perspective, you, you, you've got to manage the productivity of four universities working together. That'll be, uh, that'll be fun in and of itself. But um, what, what, what inspires from a new alliance perspective the, 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 the sort of education and training flavour this report's had? How do you flow on from that? Yeah, look, um, um, thanks for the, the question. So let me lead by saying, um, <clears throat> you know, we are four universities working together to deliver the multiversity, and we have just uh, uh, announced um, a joint task force uh, with TAFE New South Wales. Um, so, you know, we are, we are now five organisations rowing in the same direction. Um, and I think, you know, the key, the immediate key is obviously how do we bounce back uh, from COVID and, and what does that look like? Um, but in the same breath, you know, we are, um, are lucky enough to be working on a project, you know, with a, with a 10 year horizon um, and it will really sort of, um, in the end, be a, a defining piece of infrastructure uh, in Western Sydney. But underneath the infrastructure, I think is the point you're getting at, um, Chris, which is, um, you know, how do we deliver um, uh, a, a education and training model that can actually increase the productivity uh, in the area and by that, what I really mean is bring the kids uh, into, the, uh, into the education and training regime that aren't currently being fully utilised yep. uh, and also um, give opportunities for, you know, job changes, uh, people that are, you know, being dislocated because of COVID or even, you know, as we sort of go along uh, in our careers and people decide to, to make a change. So um, <clears throat> that's really the opportunity that we are focused on, both in the short term, uh, the medium and the long term. Um, and as part of that, you know, Essentially, and this links back to what we're seeing in the in the work of the Productivity Commission, which is, you know, what's the opportunity to build um, a fully fledged um, um, operating education model based on micro credentialing? Uh, how does that actually link in with where people want to go? How can you actually get recognition of prior learning for the activities and the skills that you've got? And how can you stack that then as an opportunity to do the next thing? And that's really uh, what we're focused on, on building at the moment. Um, just a small job, a little bit in that, uh, but really I come back to, you know, there's a real opportunity to sort of unlock the capacity in the area. And Matt, look, I'm so glad you mentioned that micro-credential because it applies across the sphere, doesn't it, to both the higher universities and TAFE. And what, what people are saying to us is we might have someone who's done three quarters of a, a course, whether three quarters of a trade or three quarters of a university degree, then they drop out and they have nothing. So wouldn't it be nice if after six months, they could get some sort of a recognition or a certificate and maybe restructure the course so that they do have these bite-sized marketable bits. And then the downside people will say, oh, that's no good because if you have a building a builder, for example, and they've only done one six months of it, they can't really go on the site and do X, Y, Z. Well, they can, I believe. They can go on the site because they can do more than an unskilled labourer because they've got this six months micro-credential. And similarly, with the advanced sort of sciences and professions, I'm with you 100% on the micro-credential. Yeah, six absolutely. months of my economics law degree did give me the chance to get to press council and defamation court and come out of it, but they wouldn't give me any, any sort of certificate, so. Uh. And look where you are now. Um, <laughs> look, the other thing I was, I was gonna say, linking back to what Peter was saying, is, um, you know, imagine if we had uh, an opportunity to, to build uh, an, a, a technology-driven solution that actually tracked uh, those micro-credentials. You know, imagine if there was such a thing called the blockchain. 
uh, you know, and so those are the real opportunities that we are looking at. Um, and, and to be clear, you know, it, it's a combination of the work of the universities and, and TAFE, but, you know, without that key industry input, uh, without understanding what the, what the industry um, uh, driver is and how we can fill the gap that they see over the next few years, uh, you know, it's missing a whole piece. And so we're also focused on bringing in what is, what's the industry opportunities where are we headed over the next few years? How can we connect the economic developments in industry with the you know, local needs uh, from students in the area? And look, if there's one area that has an awful lot of regulation at my, my eight years on the West City Uni Board, it's, it's, it's academia. So, and it's also an area that's facing massive, massive challenges going forward. I'll come to Ramin in a minute, but I'm sure she'd like the productivity as a Western Sydney student, not having to schlep into the city with more, more education, like allegedly as well. Um, can I jump down to Marianne Graham? Um, she looks like a 40s movie star down there. It's a, amazing. She's also a rock star of water in this town. And, um, and you must have been pretty excited uh, by the amount of attention Peter's review has shown to, to Water Mary Ann. Um, another area that needs regulatory reform, that in this case, city water's leading, uh, but also that challenge of, of managing the growth of Western Sydney. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm happy to say that we um, absolutely welcome uh, your recommendations, Peter, um, particularly the focus on innovation and regulatory reform. Um, as you know, uh, as we're Australia's largest uh, water utility and we're faced with a very changing environment at the moment. As an organisation, um, as all other water utilities, we started out really um, with, with the objective of making sure that people's water supply uh, was healthy um, and that there was a level of water security. But, you know, in this day and age, it, it's much more than that. And with the challenges of COVID-19 um, and the last 18 months with such a prolonged dry period, the drought, bushfires, then we had the floods. You know, we're facing, I think, um, a very unique time in, in history. And it's one that I think if we don't take the opportunity to really uh, work together across industry, across academia, um, across government, now is the time. If, if we don't do that, we are missing a golden opportunity. And I think particularly uh, in Western Sydney, where we have such um, big challenges around water supply, around the impacts of climate change, uh, now is that time and, and we're delighted with your focus on innovation uh, to help drive productivity. Um, we just last week launched our Urban Topologies Report, which we developed in partnership with Bly Tanner and Architectus. And I think it's a great example um, of the innovative approach that, that we need to take to building resilience, which is so important to productivity as well. Um, and that just showcases the smart water planning topologies that can be used to guide development across growth communities. Um, you know, we've been absolutely blown away by the findings around reducing urban, the, as people in Western Sydney are very familiar with, the urban heat island effect. Um, and just by implementing simple cooling initiatives like permeable surfaces and working with the development community, um, you know, better tree planting, better choice of the trees that we're, we are planting, uh, better irrigation, and how do we use recycled water to really help supplement water supply, particularly in the, the parkland city. Um, you know, the modelling shows that compared to what we're doing today, by 2055, if we have adopted those topologies, we can reduce the average temperature on an extreme heat day in Western Sydney by up to 4.6 degrees. Um, and equally, you know, reduce the number of extreme heat stress days in summer from 47 down to 19. Productivity and, the number and of sustainability. Days, no of thermal time. stress, more than doubles. Absolutely. So, you know, um, I noticed there that the number one um, uh, occupation that we're struggling to get people into is air conditioning technicians. Um, you know, we'd like to think that we can not only help with jobs, um, but also reducing the amount of energy we need 
to actually provide cooling, mm. um, looking at how we can actually turn waste to energy. You know, we're already producing our own energy at a number of our water treatment plants. Mm. Um, and I, I note from some of the comments there, people are asking about um, what Sydney Water is doing in that innovation space. We've, we've recently um, been doing some terrific work with Sydney Science Park and also with Western Sydney Airport. And I think, you know, they are two organisations that can really help in Sydney. Um, but again, it'll only work if we are all working together. And um, you'll be delighted to know, Peter, that we have uh, about to commence work on our uh, uh, EIS for our Upper South Creek, um, which will again service that, that parkland city and, and provide services to areas out there that um, are still on septic tank, uh, which is just unbelievable. But um, yeah, we're delighted to, to support the report and uh, looking, looking forward to being able to work with, with uh, yourself and industry on, on getting some of those recommendations through. And Marianne, it was wonderful that we were able to showcase some of the work Sydney Water and has been doing out in the Parkland City, etc. One, one of the other, I guess, more broader issues that we're looking at, I don't expect a comment from you, Marianne, it'd be very unfair, but we're suggesting that for many of the water utilities, and we've got 97 in New South Wales, I mean, Sydney Water obviously has economies of scale, etc. We've got these tiny little ones as well. But we're suggesting these, these water utilities have to they've got ambidextrous they've got to run as a business and people say oh yeah they've got to be efficient they've got to do this they've got to do that but they also have these community service obligations the government says uh, so on one side they're saying you've got to do this you've got to do this at the same time they're saying oh but you can't make too much profit you've got to do this you've got to do that so what we're suggesting is that there be a clearer uh, statement from the government as to the community services obligations of corporations such as the water utility, so that at the moment the water utilities are, are saying, well, we interpret effectiveness and lifestyle X, Y, Z, but um, it may well be that, that if there was a greater granularity of that, then the utilities could focus more on achieving certain things. But hopefully the utility would have input into what those community service obligations should be because they're closest to the, to the coalface. Well, if I think about the future of Western Sydney, I instantly think of Ramin Malik um, as a, a living, breathing future of, the, of this region. Ramin, Peter spoke about the community's acceptance of regulatory reform in a post-COVID world. We've all we'll, we'll, you know, let no crisis go unleveraged, but how much that confidence will remain before nimbyism sets back in again. Is your generation, you think, speaking for all of them, as I know you can, um, is, do you think there's a generational change that we can accept um, a more rigorous, less regulated future, if it leads to better jobs, better, better communities, et cetera? I think a lot of industries are just being turned in their heads in terms of those linear structures that you're seeing. Um, I think everything's kind of dismantling around us. And I think young people are really taking advantage of the flexibility that comes with innovating and seeing how we can do processes differently and collaborate together. So for example, um, you know, we mentioned earlier this idea of micro-credentialing, you know, when I think about my degree as a chemical engineer, will I ever actually work as a chemical engineer working nine to five at a plant? Probably not. But I'll transfer a lot of those skills into the different jobs and roles that I'll be going into. So I yeah. think a lot of young people will be embracing flexibility in the future. And all of those systems that were made up to be so difficult to dismantle, we're hoping that they're flexible because that's how things are changing. You know, we're seeing the climate changing so drastically just over months and weeks. So we need to have those regulatory systems in place that we can adapt to those changes. But I think at the same time, we do need a lot of long-term planning. So I guess, you know, something that's at the forefront for a lot of young people is the future of the climate and the future of housing. You know, what goals are we working towards and do we actually have plans that are going to reach those goals? So I think it's kind of ebbing and flowing between the two, having that certainty of what our future will look like but then also having the flexibility to adapt to the changing times, to adapt to changing technologies and all of those things. Well, I might, I'm going to throw it to Adam now to take through like some of the questions from our, our 70 odd uh, attendees have been dropping in. All I'm taking this mostly from this is that one of my sons studying to be a school teacher and I keep him going right here is, but the one studying law is going to go and take up air, air conditioning 
mechanic work because there appears to be dollars in, 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 in uh, keeping my bedroom cool. Um, I'm going to hand over to my partner in crime, Adam, who's been uh, moderator extraordinaire looking at all of the uh, engagement on, on the screen. I haven't seen Brian Brown's question yet. I've been looking for it. Um, but um, I'll hand over to you, Adam. Thanks, Christopher. Yes, Brian has been noticeably absent, so I certainly encourage you in the next 15 minutes to um, his question forward. Um, first one I, I had, it, it sort of follows on from Christopher's point earlier on. Um, Peter, um, the report obviously outlines some important areas of reform. Um, obviously, in order to enact some of this change, it's going to require a fairly bold political buy-in. Um, what's the process, as, as you see, when it comes to securing that political cut through to ensure that some of these reform ideas lead to actions, not just proposals and, and ideas? Uh, look, wonderful, wonderful question. And um, look, look, uh, any any taxi driver with an iPad can come up with an idea, right? It's a matter of implementing it, getting it done. And that's why full credit to uh, Christopher and uh, David Borger and others for things like getting the Western Sydney Airport up and running. I mean, that, that, that is a lot of work. What I was hoping, what I'm hoping to do here is get community buy-in from the green paper to the white paper. So I've got 56 recommendations in there. I'm not, Adam, going to put all of them up. Some of them might fall up on the wayside, right? But um, I, I'm, I'm chipping away. And if you take, for example, the plebiscite on local council rates, right? Now, uh, I'll use that as an example. If I just put that up as an uh, we we suggest that all local councils can charge whatever rates they want. That would have been knocked back. If I made that announcement at nine o'clock, quarter past nine, the, the government said, we're not gonna do it, right? So what we've done is we've watered the wicket. We've said, look, if the community really wants better services in their local government area, if they want more infrastructure, and they've been to IPART and they, they, they don't quite meet all the regulations, then they should be able to go to the community and have a vote. And if they've got a strong enough case then they should be able to raise the rates above the capping level. Now, I think there's there's a bit of an appetite for that now, a bit of an appetite. That's because we're chipping away and uh, we're hearing the warts. People say, well, it won't work because of this. And we take those into account and we adjust them. So mm. look, I'm, I'm a realist, Adam, uh, and I know that uh, all 56 recommendations won't get up. Um, mainly for most recommendations, there might be nine winners and one loser. So, for example, we take the one of recognising uh, bipartisan recognising qualifications from other states. In, in a builder might want to be able to uh, might have a shortage because of the bushfire of the jip rockers and the plumbers, and that might want to recognise them. So the builder might want them to come in, but the people who are the plumbers and that may not want these other people coming in because they think the quality is not as good. So there is a big conversation to be had, a dialogue, as to use the words that you guys like to use. Yeah. Certainly based on the, the submissions and the response you've had to the report originally, it's it's certainly tra trending in the right direction in terms of providing that platform to, to take further. Um, on I will the say, Adam, if I can just make one thing, I, not one of my recommendations uh, or the draft recommendations has been categorically ruled out. Right. And, and I, I, I take that as a good key performance indicator. I've said to, I've been around the traps to all the bureaucrats and to everybody saying, I'm going to release this. Can you please not knock anything back in the first two weeks? Not only have they, there's no one knocked anything back, but in two weeks, it's been three weeks now, and they, people haven't come out and said, we're going to knock that back. It may well be that I don't present a strong enough case and some of them don't get up in, in the white paper, but I'm, I'm feeling reasonably confident that at least some of them will get through. Yeah, an encouraging sign, certainly. Um, one from Anne here around small business. Um, her question states, small businesses are more likely to become bankrupt than large business. How can we help small business to understand the degree of their exposure? Which is a, an apt question given the, the number of SMEs in, in Western Sydney. Um, one to the, the panel and yourself, Peter. Well, the uh, federal government, I think, is making an, has made an announcement this morning on that uh, in relation to uh, allowing small businesses to trade with debts of less than a million dollars to be able to trade with the assistance of a, of a coordinator. Uh, that's a, a more a federal thing. Uh, and I think uh, uh, ASIC, as, as you might know, I'm involved, I'm chair of the ASIC audit committee. ASIC is also uh, looking at a number of ways to allow uh, businesses to trade while technically uh, in, the, in, in the past, they may not have had the cash flow they can now. So, but also in New South Wales, uh, and to answer your question, we're very fortunate to have 
recently appointed Chris Lamont as the new Small Business Commissioner, uh, and Chris has been out and about listening to small business, which are the engine room of mm. job creation. Indeed. Um, one for the for the rest of the panel now to, to touch on um, a word which I've not come across, but I'm happy to take it. How do we encourage the government to move away from short-termism um, to it'd be, it'd be more adaptive to more strategic driven actions which can generate bigger savings, certainty and stimulus? Marianne, you want to have a crack at that one? Yes. Um... Are we, are we talking generally, I guess, or even from I think it's generally, I mean, obviously from, from your perspective, when it comes to water, it's, it's probably, you know, one that you guys have, have come across in terms of looking at more of a longer term strategic, you know, uh, standpoint on, on how to, you know, institute, you know, um, actions and you know, initiatives that can get to where you need to, rather than looking at short term wins in a climate, which is um, obviously a bit skewed in, in these current circumstances. Yeah. Look, I think um, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, with with the political cycles, we will need to be able to uh, work our way through and navigate um, political cycles. But I think, you know, if if we do come together and work collectively on what we see as being the things we need to ensure a sustainable and productive future for greater Sydney and for New South Wales um, more broadly, you know, we can put the frameworks in place now to ensure that we, we get the outcomes that we want well into the future. And, you know, regulatory reform is obviously one that we need to look at. At the moment, uh, Sydney Water and, and other water utilities work to a four-year cycle for funding through IPART. And, you know, whilst we can um, develop our longer-term strategies, Obviously, we need to ensure that we've got some level of parallel thinking um, and forward thinking coming through from the regulatory environment as well. Um, you know, if, if we take one of the recommendations that Peter has said about developer contributions, we're certainly very keen to look at what other options there are. Um, both Hunter Water and, and Sydney Water are the only two water utilities in Australia that don't actually receive developer contribution. Um, they, were, they were stopped um, as part of a um, productivity push actually following the, the GFC. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's time to start looking at some of these regulatory issues. Um, what the answer is, you know, is up for debate, but I think you know, we, we do need to work together uh, and the New South Wales government is currently looking at the uh, Greater Sydney Water Strategy and the State Water Strategy to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. And that is um, reflecting some of the things, Peter, that you spoke about earlier. It's about really starting to understand if there are opportunities um, to be doing things differently, more effectively, uh, to ensure that we're balancing demand and supply and that we are looking at, you know, what are some of the innovations that we can take now to ensure that we've got a sustainable city well into the future? Uh, and if that means changing the way that we develop things, uh, if that means introducing recycled water, um, and certainly as a first phase, just to be helping with irrigation um, mm. and, and capturing stormwater. I mean, that's one of the, the, the biggest issues that we face as a country is that we don't capture stormwater mm. effectively. Yeah. So, you know, there are multiple opportunities. Um, it's just a matter of getting the right people in the room and uh, getting the policy direction sorted yeah. and getting on with the job. Yeah. On the topic of, of short-term challenges and, and long-term focus, uh, education, you mentioned Peter early on in the piece, is one of the, the key discussion areas. Um, doesn't go into, into detail around the tertiary sector, obviously being at a, at a federal level. Um, you know, we can't get away from the fact that the tertiary sector has a, has a large role to play in, in Greater Western Sydney. Obviously, there's been a lot spoken about um, the challenges it's facing at the moment, particularly when it comes to overseas students and perhaps a lack of federal support um, when it comes to addressing future funding gaps, especially in the areas of research. And we've heard a lot of, of, of that narrative recently. As one of the key pillars when it comes to, to jobs, growth and productivity and, and recognising the importance of institutions like like um, the ones you represent through NUW Alliance, Matt, and WSU, 
if we're serious about sustainable jobs growth, are we really in tune with some of the, the key issues and challenges that universities are currently facing and, and the impact it's likely to have on future capacity of our next generation of workers like Ramin? Yeah, look, absolutely. I think, um, <clears throat> let me just say, I am um, particularly in tune uh, with the challenges facing the sector. Um, you know, there's nothing like um, deciting to set up a, a, a new way. So yeah, your dog's got a view on this as well, on the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah. It does Every dog and his brother's got something to say. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there's nothing like setting up an entirely new education and training model, uh, you know, in the middle of a pandemic across four universities. Uh, linking in, you know, federal and state stakeholders. So, uh, look, you know, I, I mean, particularly attuned to the, the challenges, but I think instead of looking at it like a challenge, you know, there's a real opportunity um, to break down the barriers, which is what we are doing. You know, as Peter said, there's quite a bit of interest in terms of um, regulatory reform at the moment. Uh, you know, people who are um, dealing with... Um, uh, you know, COVID disruption and not particularly interested in, you know, whether it's a state or a federal uh, issue, they want solutions and opportunities. Uh, and that's where things like the multiversity, which is, you know, industry connected, industry led, um, looking at the future opportunities, uh, not only in Western Sydney, but across the, uh, but across the sector, uh, it is definitely something that, that we are looking at. And I think that, um, uh, you know, where we can uh, look at new and innovative opportunities and where we can stack those on you know concepts like micro credentials really provides us with the opportunity to sort of do things differently uh and unlock that economic opportunity the, the issue of micro credentials is one that's been getting a lot of commentary in recent times and you guys have spoken a lot a lot about it this morning i want to get ramin's view on this because i think um one of the interesting things that i found and particularly given western sydney's demographic um, when you've got a, a young aspiring group, um, large percentage from a non-English speaking background, um, I, I get the sense that there's a view culturally around universities being the the one pathway for for young young kids moving forward. Um, Ramin, how do you how do you think the next generation of students coming through will negotiate the the messaging around different pathways? as opposed to the traditional means of just going to university. And that's the expectation that their parents have got, that you know, university is the way forward. So something a bit more of a hybrid model that incorporates vocational training, you know, micro-credentialing, those other aspects, which are non sort of less traditional than what's been, um, what their ex expectations are. How would you broach that conversation with your parents and the expectation that they might have around your pathway forward? Um, yeah, I think it kind of goes back to um, like, why do, you know, migrant parents really want their kids to go to university? Um, quite often, a lot of kids going into university are the first in their family to even get, you know, a tertiary education. So that education that you could get, you know, from advisors, from parents as to the alternate pathways available are very, very slim. And I think, you know, it's also a reflection on um, the secondary education model as well. You know, where is that advice coming from for potential students? You know, um, the idea of a careers counsellor wasn't really present for me when I was growing up in school. It was just, do you hate your C and get into university? So I think um, that type of support needs to be there, understanding the situation that a lot of students are in where they just don't have that advice. Um, I think that's um, very much a first pathway of it, but then kind of putting the onus back on employers. You know, right now, nearly every single entry level job requires you to have a tertiary education. Um, and it kind of seems redundant these days because, you know, they won't ask you to have a qualification in X, Y, Z, but just that you do have a university degree. Um, so I think the onus needs to be put on employers to um, recognize micro credentials, to recognize TAFE, um, to recognize that a lot of people who are going through these pathways are just as qualified as someone who would have gone through the university education system. And I think that feeds back into, I guess, that parental pressure. All your parents really want for you is, you know, a stable job, a chance at a better life and a chance at a better income. And so if you're not getting that, um, you know, go, going through the pathways that exist, then I think that onus falls on, you know, those career counsellors out there, those people who are giving advice and the employers to really step up and say that we'll recognise these qualifications. And um, ideally look at that hybrid work education model. You know, a lot of low SES background students 
are dropping out of university education because they can't afford to work and study at the same time. You know, personally, as a STEM student, the first four years of my degree, I could not work at all because my university timetable was so busy. And so we need to really look at how are we actually empowering students to work, earn a living um, and educate themselves at the same time. And I think that's where like innovations in online teaching um, and online education are coming in. So I think um, it's a cross kind of um, responsibility model. I don't think it mm. falls on one particular person to carry that. Um, and yeah, I think it's employers, it's educators, it's teachers to come to the table and really present all those options to both students um, and their parents. Agree. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. I know we've sort of, we've hit the mark. Um, in wrapping up today, uh, firstly, I have to apologise to those who sent through, there's a bunch of questions which I uh, know I didn't get to. Um, I will print out these and provide them, Peter, if you're okay with that, just so you put that feedback and the questions and um, hopefully that's incorporated into, into the report and submissions. Um, but in, in wrapping up, um, look, obviously, firstly, the work you and your team have done, on, on obviously, uh, over a number of months and uh, Peter, the development of, of this green paper document that um, is not only wide ranging and comprehensive, but as we heard today, uh, puts forward an ambitious reform agenda that um, can help lay the, the building, block, building blocks for future prosperity and growth. So, so thank you for the work you and the guys have done, Peter. It's, it's, a, it's an impressive piece of work. Um, thank you to our panelists, uh, Mary Ann Graham from Sydney Water, um, Water's rock star, according to Christopher, um, an organisation which is leading the way when it comes to innovation, as they say, doing water differently. And um, obviously we'll have a key role when it comes to driving Western Sydney sustainability agenda. Um, Matt Geisman from NUW Alliance uh, and the work his group, group is doing to secure a brighter future for students in the region and through the multiversity at the Aerotropolis. Um, and of course, Ramin Malik, who's living proof of the, of the talent that's coming through the region. Thank you guys for your contribution this morning. Um, if there's anything, anything further that you guys want to add, um, well, actually, a selfless plug, I've just been informed by the guys downstairs. Um, for the dialogue, our Boomtown conference is coming up 9th of December. Save the date for that one. Um, there'll be more information coming out over the coming months. But thank you, everyone who contributed online, um, who was here this morning. And um, yeah, look forward to the, continuing the conversation moving ahead. Thanks, guys. Thank you.